Hello, welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics' 2021 spring semester, The Modern American City, Past, Present, and Future. I am Patrick Tuohy with the Better Cities Project, a fellow at the Dole Institute. This is our third of seven sessions. Previously, we've discussed demographic shifts in cities and issues relating to municipal finance. Today, we will discuss segregation, race, and city policy. And let me begin with an admission. While I may never have argued that racism was a non-factor in housing, I was legitimately shocked, and still am, to learn from the book Race, Real Estate, and Uneven Development by Kevin Fox Gotham, a KU graduate, that the National Association of Real Estate Boards amended their code of ethics in 1924 to read, quote, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood members of any race or nationality whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. This wasn't just a wink and a nod. It was an assertion in which they were confident enough to place it in print in their code of ethics, and I still find that amazing. Today, I wanna to talk with my guests about the degree to which housing segregation was a purposeful, decades-long campaign by cities, states, and the federal government, that it was national in scope, and that it targeted not just blacks, but immigrants and the poor. The impact of segregationist policies remain with us today. They are driving up costs for everyone and are having significant detrimental effects to the economy. We can certainly talk about the spectrum of policy solutions that have been offered, but I really want to focus today on making the case that segregation is not just a matter of disparate outcomes over time, but intentional planning. My guests today are Ed Pinto and Mark Treskin, Ed Pinto is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's director of AEI's Housing Center, which monitors the housing market using a unique set of indicators. Active in housing finance for over 40 years, he was an executive vice president and chief credit officer for Fannie Mae until the late 1980s. Mark Treskin is a senior research associate in the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center at the Urban Institute. The research interests of his include housing and home ownership policy, as well as neighborhood development and change. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for uh, joining me today to talk about this topic. Uh, and first, let me ask each of you, and I'll, I'll start with Mark, is there anything in my admittedly sweeping uh, description that you find fault with? I'm often accused of being overly dramatic. I think it's a good start. Um, I mean, obviously, the I'd say the proof is in the pudding and that the dynamics, I think, vary a little bit from city to city and place to place. But I think the overall story that this was a concerted set of policy decisions made it all look up to the government. Um, and, you know, working with industry and basically pretty, I mean, pretty much everyone in politics and government was actually one of those things that I think created the world we're living in right now and have created the ramifications we're dealing with today. Ed, uh, it, how did I do? Did I did I get it, or, or was I too uh, histrionic? No, I, I think you got it. I, if I were to emphasize anything, it would be the extraordinary role that the federal government played in uh, making this happen. Uh, number one, in the 1920s, and number two, that this was a progressive movement, and by that I mean uh, uh, Herbert Hoover was considered to be a progressive, and there are other progressives. Uh, out of Wisconsin and, and Minnesota uh, that were leading this as being the most obvious way to uh, organize cities and neighborhoods. And uh, we'll get into it a lot more, but that really was the goal. Yeah, let me uh, pick up with that, Ed. Uh, certainly cities like uh, San Francisco and uh, Baltimore and Berkeley were early adopters of ordinances meant to keep the races segregated. Uh, it seems like the practice, like you said, really took off in 1921 when a Hoover's Department of Commerce issued guidelines for municipal zoning. Um, what was going on then in either the, the teens or the early 20s that made the federal government think it needed to step in? So what was going on uh, was, was a couple of things. One is the Supreme Court in, in 1916 uh, said that you couldn't use zoning explicitly uh, to uh, organize by race. And so there was this early decision that didn't stop a number of places from still taking various actions, but uh, there was a general feeling that you couldn't use zoning directly for that. 
uh, number one. Number two, there was the beginning of what became known as the Great Migration from the South to the North. Uh, and 1915 is one of the start, sort of starting points of that. And as uh, blacks moved up uh, into the North, uh, they had low incomes. They were moving from a low wage area in the South, and they ended up quickly overrunning the areas that were lower cost in the Northern cities and then moving into other areas. And that created uh, uh, this concern that we have to stop what was called an invasion. Um, and the uh, solution, uh, and Congress actually passed a, a statute, enabling statute for the Commerce Department in a, a late 1920 or early 21 that authorized the Commerce Department to undertake studies having to do with uh, urban planning, uh, zoning, and other things that were related to that. And so Herbert Hoover, uh, he was an engineer, uh, and he took this with a vengeance, and he thought you could uh, figure out anything um, in, from a technical perspective. And he basically organized a commission, but everybody on the commission were planners and urban planners in particular, uh, and pro again, progressives as he was. And they all had the same vision that we need to keep the races separate. And since we can't do it legally, we can do it economically. And they realized that if you made housing expensive, uh, then blacks couldn't move into these neighborhoods that uh, they wanted to keep them out of that they couldn't do directly. And well, how did you make housing expensive? Well, uh, first of all, you said you can only build one unit, single family detached houses. Second of all, they had to be detached, meaning side yards, front yards, large lot, larger lots than had been nor uh, considered normal, um, more expensive materials. Uh, they had other building code requirements uh, and things of that nature, all of which pushed the price up. As you push the price up, it basically priced the blacks uh, that were moving up from the south and already living in the north out of those markets. They also thought it would price out the uh, uh, ethnic uh, groups that were moving in from uh, southern Europe and, and eastern Europe. Uh, but those groups uh, were coming uh, from somewhat of a history of uh, small businesses and, and even home ownership. And as they got here, they fairly quickly uh, moved up the uh, economic ladder. And so they were able to afford houses by the 30s and 40s in these areas that uh, were designed to price them out. And, and so uh, it didn't work, quite work the same way. Uh, what happened was, as you mentioned, there were some zoning ordinances in the, uh, in the teens. Um, and, but in 1921, it was considered illegal to say you couldn't build a duplex in an area that had one, one unit houses. That was considered, again, an unconstitutional taking of property. By 1926 and 1928, following a Supreme Court case, Euclid versus Ohio in 26, and other cases that quickly followed, it became the law of the land that you could ban everything but single family houses from a zone. Uh, and that became known as Euclidean zoning. And so uh, Herbert Hoover and this commission were on this very early. 1921, they started coming out with model ordinances and, and they actually started tracking all of the municipalities that were adopting ordinances and they were making sure that the ordinances met the sort of the economic hurdles, imposed the economic hurdles that were desired in order to accomplish the policy that I mentioned earlier. This continued in the 20s and, and very shortly by I think 26, there was a larger and larger segment of the population that was subject to uh, the zoning that met the standards of the Commerce Department. Um, and by the early 1930s, uh, that zoning had really progressed throughout the country uh, you have to ask yourself, how is it in a country with, at the time, 48 states and a District of Columbia that within a period of two years after 1921, the number of communities that had zoning ordinances doubled in a very short period of time, and all of the Supreme Courts and legislatures in the virtually every state ended up adopting what the uh, uh, Commerce Department was recommending. That all happened very, very quickly. Uh, in a country that, again, had 50 different Supreme Courts and, excuse me, 48 different Supreme Courts and 48 different uh, legislatures. Um, I'll stop there before we get into what then FHA, when they took up the mantle sure. next. Sure. So, so, let me, so, so let me let me get back, uh, me get to, back to the back beginning back and, and talk a little about, about uh, 
I guess, naive Patrick's view of the world when I was younger. What is the the best argument on behalf of the people, maybe Hoover and, and his colleagues, the Department of Commerce that wanted to uh, create zoning? Do we do we have to assume that they were they they were um, uh, motivated by racism, or uh, can we say that they really were seeing a growing country and they wanted to come up with codes that uh, allowed for safe buildings and safe construction? I mean, what is the what is the evidence that this really was motivated by race? Ghana, a study. I like to go back to the original documents that were contemporaneous with the time. And so I went back, I spent, oh, about three months looking at these documents from the late teens in the 20, early 20th century up through the 40s and 50s. And I eventually read probably 20,000 pages, give or take. Uh, but they were all what I would call original uh, documents that what was published by the Commerce Department was published by FHA or secondary documents that were contemporaneous, pub, contemporaneously published by experts. Uh, what I found was the language in the documents themselves uh, that were the primary documents didn't particularly use racially uh, insensitive language or uh, inflammatory language, uh, but they had code words uh, for various uh, things that uh, were used that really people knew what they meant. Uh, and then we'd call, I guess they're called dog whistles today, uh, but they were code words that were used. Uh, and uh, the, they, they basically focused a lot on property value. They said, if you allow uh, things to happen that don't follow these particular uh, uh, standards, you will have lower property value. Uh, the, but what I really found interesting to, to surely shed light on this was there was an author who happened to be both an appraiser, and he, over a span of 30 years, he wrote uh, six or seven editions of one of the leading appraiser manuals, uh, uh, Mr. McNight McMichaels, and, but he also wrote two treatises on urban growth. And uh, those two treatises, one was in 1923, right when this uh, was being launched by the Commerce Department. And in that treatise, he has a couple of sentences about zoning, and he has a, a sentence or two about race, and what he says about race is, well, of course, the Supreme Court says you can't zone based on race. And by the way, the Supreme Court won't enforce these things anyway. Uh, that's pretty much what he says in a 300 page or 250 page document. By 1928, when he issues the second edition, uh, there's now two chapters, one chapter on zoning and one chapter basically on exclusionary type zoning. And uh, and he goes through very specifically what the purpose was. It was to stop this invasion by blacks and by uh, ethnic groups. And that was the purpose. And so I, I find it very interesting that, you know, over a span of five years, someone who was an expert in the field is reporting what is being done. So it's perfectly consistent, Patrick, with what you read from the uh, National uh, uh, Real Estate Boards, which is now the NAR, how explicit they were. This was very very explicitly done and written about at the time uh, by commentators and by places like the National Association of Real Estate Boards uh, and, and others. And we see it very, again, very explicitly in what FHA wrote about in their underwriting uh, manuals in the 1930s. Mark, uh, how closely does this fit with uh, the, the experience in Chicago? And let me make sure our audience knows that you authored a study for the um, Urban Institute in 2017 called the cost of segregation, where you looked at, uh, well, the cost of segregation in Chicago. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But are you aware of the, the history of segregation? Uh, uh, when did they adopt these zoning, if at all? Of course, Chicago is a much bigger city. And so maybe they had, I'll say, legitimate non-racial reasons for uh, planning. I mean, I think I'll defer to, um, in particular, on the history. I mean, I especially I think when you get down to the 20s. My sense of it um, is generally though, Chicago is a lot of ways the poster child for this work. Um, and I think it fits into this history very, very well. And it might be a bigger city, but I think when you're talking about the great migration and 
the development of zoning and exclusion that Chicago really highlights pretty much every one of these things. Um, and I think, you know, we're still kind of, I think we'll get into maybe the 40s and 50s and urban renewal in a few minutes. Um, but Chicago, again, is a poster child for many of that work, my, my, much of that work as well. I mean, the only other thing I would add, and this is something that's also very common that has kind of exacerbated some of the issues with zoning over the years, is this is right around the time period by you know, the turn of the 20th century where you also have cities and municipalities forming across the country. So we have you places like Chicago or St. Louis or Detroit that have like hundreds of municipalities, each one with their own kind of set of local control that kind of instituted these sorts of decisions and you know efforts to zone. Um, you know, ex in exclusionary ways. So you actually had what had happened previously, cities just kept expanding, but around the turn of the century, they just got locked in. Um, so that led to this situation as well, where you had one kind of central city being locked into one way of doing things and surrounded by a lot of other smaller municipalities. So the kind of regional thinking that might have made sense in a growing area stopped working as well. Uh, and that had a lot of ramifications for the subsequent decades as well. I want to talk a little bit about um, that great migration that you referenced, Ed, just to kind of set the stage for our audience. So uh, like you said, around 1915, 16, and, and going on for a number of years, uh, I think 6 million Blacks moved out of the South into the North and West. And uh, while there may have been certainly segregation and in, in Jim Crow laws in the South, uh, Northern employers, Northern real estate agents saw this migration and uh, I, I think adopted a lot of zoning regulations in order to protect their property values against this influx of people. And to your point, when the Supreme Court said, I want to say it was the Buchanan decision in 1916, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, when the Supreme Court said you can't zone explicitly by race, uh, then to your point, they said, well, we can achieve the same ends if we just drive up the costs uh, to protect. And again, the, the word that you see in these documents is invasion, uh, or undesirable uh, populations coming in. Um, you you mentioned, Ed, the FHA. So I, I, I'll tell a little bit about what I know. And, and again, you can, you can fill in the important details. So in the 30s, Congress creates, um, I think, the FHA first, and then the uh, HOLC, which stands for the uh, Home Ownership uh, Something Something, forgive me. And the job, again, it's a good sounding a campaign, or, or I should say a good sounding effort, which is to encourage home ownership, to uh, provide for the insurance or, or for insuring mortgages to get more people into homes. But what the HOLC did is they looked at these uh, top 100 cities, 114, I think, markets, and they uh, assessed the risk of a mortgage. And I think they had four scales and the, the, the lowest of them uh, which they marked in red, which is where we get the term redlining that people might be familiar with, uh, were what they considered to be dangerous or bad investments. And of course, those were largely black and uh, immigrant populations. But but what was Congress thinking? Um, again, and maybe it's just because I'm naive, but were, was Congress really thinking in overtly racial terms when they set up the FHA and the HOLC? Or can we take them at their word that they really wanted to encourage home ownership and that in the course of doing it, uh, kind of the wheels came off? Well, I, I think it, it's got to be a mixture of both. And I, I was just looking at something uh, having to do with the Davis-Bacon Act, which is the uh, prevailing wage act that uh, is in the news even today. Um, but it was passed back in the 30s. And I forget whether it was Davis or Bacon, um, the, it was named after the two sponsors, uh, but he did not want um, to have low-wage uh, black-owned companies that hired blacks getting federal contracts because they were going to prevent higher-wage union uh, co uh, contractors from competing. And so he created, as the as one of the sponsors, the Davis-Bacon Act. It had racial reasons back in the 30s of why they were doing it. Now, there might have been other reasons, too, but there certainly was a race, racial uh, undertone to it that was very explicit. Um, during the 20s, um, there was, as, as you said, there was this mig huge migration that starts in, in 15. And uh, the 
that there was segregation already in the South. It was very segregated, but the North was already very segregated in uh, the early 20th century. And the goal then was to keep it that way. Uh, as that population grew, you can only put so many people in the areas that were currently segregated. Um, and therefore you needed to um, uh, keep them out of these other areas and allow the uh, segregated areas to grow some, but you had to separate them. And so they created areas that were near rail lines and industry and close, you know, close to undesirable factories and things of that uh, nature. And those areas were uh, zoned for uh, that type of housing. Um, and because they wouldn't be used for the higher cost housing that they were trying to promote through uh, the single family zoning. When you get to FHA, uh, FHA uh, takes over in effect for the business that uh, the Commerce Department was doing. It becomes for the first time really a national housing agency, even though it's an insurer. It's really have other has other functions as a national housing agency. And it starts looking at a lot of these things and it writes underwriting requirements. And they basically follow the zoning plan that had been developed in the 20s. Uh, and was still in place and was still being implemented uh, to basically keep things segregated um, and to make things more expensive. And so they were like the HOLC, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, they were looking at risk and they were going, well, uh, they were making 20-year loans. And this was part of the issue that relates to the Homeowners Loan Corporation. They were making 15-year loans. And the state of housing uh, the supply, the condition of housing supply, back in the 1930s, and this has nothing to do with the Great Depression. This is what had existed before the Depression. It just, there was lots of low quality housing in the United States, uh, just because that's the way it was back then. And you couldn't make a 20 year loan or a 15 year loan on that housing. And I think that if you wanna put a positive note on it, the people who were running the program were required to make sure that the program uh, was fiscally responsible and therefore they look around and they go, well, we can't make loans on properties that are in really bad condition because they're not going to be able to make payments over the required 15 or 20 years. Um, that fit, of course, well into the whole idea of we want to keep things uh, segregated. And uh, FHA picked up that mantle and they were very, very explicit in their underwriting guidelines. It, do, it only constitutes about 2% of their underwriting guidelines, but that 2% is very explicit, like that statement you read from the National Association of Real Estate Boards. We don't want to have mixing of races. We don't want to have mixing of ethnic groups. Uh, and it's all based on, on property values. And FHA actually went to the extreme of saying to certain cities, and Los Angeles is one of them, which was a large growing city. It was zoned to have a lot of lots, a lot of housing built on a lot of lots. And FHA came in and said, no, 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 you can't do that. If your zoning doesn't comport with our standards, you're not gonna be eligible for FHA financing. And in short order, Los Angeles and some other cities changed their zoning laws to get in line with again, what had been developed in the 20s and which was now being enforced by FHA. So just to, so just to uh, restate, uh, restate, it, it, wasn't, a it, it wasn't, wasn't a matter that the HOLC and the FHA simply took the zoning ordinances that existed before them uh, and, and kind of applied the, the, uh, the mortgage and the insurance uh, standards to them. They, they themselves were also explicit about uh, race mixing or, or uh, maintaining segregation in, in giving out these loans. I, I just really want to make the case uh, for the listeners because it was something that I came to slowly that this isn't just a matter of uh, desperate outcomes. This is an intentional policy of keeping the races apart. Can't speak to the HOLC on that. Uh, 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 they were, goes to the issue of, is the housing going to last long enough? Can you make a 15 year loan, et cetera? FHA was very explicit about it, you need to have your zoning ordinance that comports with the racial segregation that we are trying to accomplish with FHA financing and uh, then the subdivision development and all of that. And, and that Los Angeles example you know, is one that actually happened in the 1930s. That I can speak to FHA doing that. I really can't speak to 
HOLC, but it doesn't make, make any difference. HOLC actually has a fairly short history. It makes loans for a couple of years and then in effect stops making loans and then is in runoff until 1948 or so. And so it actually um, existed for a, in, as an operational entity making loans for just a few years. FHA, of course, starts in 1934 and continues to this date having a you know very large uh, uh, impact on the United States housing finance. Uh, and let me invite uh, the audience to submit questions that they have to uh, any of our panelists at dolequestions at ku.edu. Towards the end of the discussion, we will endeavor to get as many of them uh, as possible. But again, dolequestions at ku.edu. Um, so Mark, we, we end there. Well, we don't end there, but uh, fast forward the 30s and 40s. And then in the 50s and 60s, we I say we collectively get another idea that we're going to help the cities and, and we get into urban renewal. Uh, what's what's the history of that? Right, so I mean, urban renewal, I mean, there's a number of kind of programs that kind of built on this. I'm gonna do it at a somewhat broad cloth. Um, we're basically federally funded programs to uh, redevelop cities and you know communities across the country. And I think I would include in this, especially the growth of the interstate highway system and build, the building of transportation network, um, which also had a, ramp, a lot of ramifications for you know our, our cities across the country. So this really took off starting in 40s with some initial work. Um, and really in the 50s and 60s, when you think of the idea that urban renewal was brought in providing federal funding for communities to redevelop neighborhoods. Um, and this often meant redeveloping in full cloth, um, totally demolishing existing communities, replacing them with something else. You know, for if you're familiar with mid-century housing developments um, or other sort of cultural centers, I think you know there's a level where something like in Washington D.C., where I'm at, um, Southwest Waterfront was a you know a, a black community that was pretty much um, taken out by urban renewal for um, you know for basically a middle uh, middle class and middle working class housing, especially for the growing federal workforce. Um, and then examples like, you know, Lincoln Center in New York as well as another area that was an African-American community really close to Central Park that was um, demolished for this project that was building Lincoln Center. So between that and the building of highway interstates through cities and sometimes existing communities, you had this development of an incentive for localities to get federal funding because a lot of money was available. Um, there's some good studies, I know in particular New Haven's a good example of this, but it was a city like Chicago and many other big cities in this country. They wanted the federal funding because it was on some levels, as long as they had it available, they wanted to use it as much as possible. And that did have a, ha have a tendency to focus on communities of color and minority communities, black communities, um, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, many of these uh, the communities had less political capital. They were less able to um, organize successfully um, than some of the other communities. I think people familiar with Jane Jacobs was able to fight some of the proposed development of a freeway through Lower Manhattan, actually Soho, um, um, in a way that um, you know people in say the South Bronx did not. So you had this tendency of these large federal project, federally funded projects to go into um, low-income minority communities and sort of exacerbate existing patterns of segregation because once those communities were demolished, people who had been living in those communities ended up living and moving more likely to other segregated neighborhoods in the communities and the cities they lived in. So let me ask you, Mark, what I asked earlier of, uh, of Ed. Do you think uh, these programs, the, the urban renewal programs, how motivated were they by kind of uh, race uh, or in segregation and how much of it was they were trying to um, alleviate poverty or bad structures, which just happened to be minority, maybe ethnic immigrant communities? It's, it's a good question. I mean, I'll save some of the archival um, insights, which I'm fascinated by, but I, I don't have the facility to talk about them to quite that extent. I, it was a little bit of a both and. I mean, I think that there were real issues with housing quality. I mean, I think when we're thinking of housing stock in cities, we weren't, you know, in lack of indoor plumbing was actually not uncommon in some neighborhoods, you know, 50, 60 years ago, um, in a way that that was definitely seen as the neighborhoods that had to be, you know, affected. You know, that was of Washington, D.C., for instance, the Southwest was that type of community. 
Um, so there's some element where housing conditions and housing quality was an example of that, um, but it was also, there was some explicit race going on throughout this. I mean, I think in any, ex any city you can come up with, there's examples of that this is targeted to a particular community, not another community based on race and you know, economics. Ed, what is your uh, familiarity with urban renewal? Uh, maybe you've looked at other cities. Was it uh, kind of just more of the same of what we saw from segregation uh, in years prior? I think uh, generally, yes. I, I think, again, there was lots of flowery language that was put around of hot principles. So, for example, in 1949, when the Housing Act was passed, uh, the, whatever the 49 Act is called, that's when we got high-rise public housing. Up to that point, high-rise public housing was considered bad. And we had garden apartments. Many of those garden apartments were built in the 30s and they're still around and they're still very good functioning housing. You can't say that about much high rise public housing. And but the view was this is the modern solution. And um, the discussion about Southeast uh, uh, Washington, uh, that was viewed as a blight, literally, it was blighted area on Washington, even though it was a working neighborhood uh, with lots of employed people, lots of stores and and little you know industry and people living above and, and inside and it was a, a very working neighborhood but it was viewed by the elites as being a blight and you mentioned you know new haven was mentioned and that's actually there's a museum at the university at yale university new haven was the original model city and the mayor was just the one who wanted to get all this money and so he, he that's how they developed the model cities program based on what he did and I was up in New Haven eight or nine years ago, and there are still highway stubs and torn down areas that are still vacant and buildings that were built in uh, sort of the brutalist style that was going to remake this area. And they literally destroyed a, a working neighborhood, but because it was considered a blight. Well, coincidentally, it also got rid of a lot of blacks that were living there and put them into public housing where then, okay, that's great. Now they're in public housing, we've taken care of it. So uh, I, I do think uh, the at, the at the best light you can put on it is there were immense in unintended consequences, but the fact that the unintended consequences are always hurting the same race and the same income group leads you to believe that uh, maybe it was that it wasn't either well thought out in the first place, or as the case of Davis-Bacon Act, there was lots of uh, a racial basis to it in the first place, same thing uh, with zoning. You have to realize that to finish up the zoning piece was to say, we want things that don't vary much. That's what zone means. We want a zone that all looks more or less the same. Well, these areas that were, they were going in with urban, what became known as urban removal, uh, and they picked highways as a way to pay for it. You run the highway through the area and you got a double, uh, benefit. Uh, they, these areas didn't meet the standard of being nice and tidy. Um, and of course, the irony is today, areas that are the most popular are areas that are walkable and the areas that tend to be walkable, the areas that have uh, a varied mix of, topography, of topologies of structures and building types and uh, single family, multifamily businesses, maybe a little industry here and there, uh, et cetera. That's what's considered popular today but back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it was the exact other way around. You know, it. it uh, I mentioned uh, Kevin Fox Gotham's book earlier. Kansas City really is, um, uh, we'll talk about Chicago, but Kansas City really has a remarkable history of this because uh, certainly we have more highway per capita, I think, than any other city in the country. And that's because uh, we benefit from being close to where Eisenhower and Truman were from. And when they were building the highway system, we did very well. But you can see, how the highways cut a swath through, uh, you know, working class black neighborhoods, and as a result, serve as a as a kind of separating them from the city. Uh, it, it really is remarkable. And of course, you talk about those older neighborhoods. I'm thinking of uh, places in Kansas City like Westport, where you will see single family homes next to, uh, uh, you know, a six apartment uh, complex, a small one. Uh, Harry Truman used to own one, uh, and then on the other side of it, another single family home. You you get uh, that kind of density, which is now so uh, looked after. Um, Mark, I, I wanna talk to you about this study in, 
in Chicago. Again, it was called The Cost of Segregation. It's a 2017 study. And what was remarkable to me was that uh, you guys were able to put a dollar value on the cost of segregation in, in wages and in, in employment and in housing. Um, uh, talk about that in a minute, but what were the circumstances in Chicago that, that made you want to take on that study? What was going on uh, that led to it? That's a good question. I mean, we've had, we've, um, there's an organization we partnered with for this study, um, the Metropolitan Planning Council, which is a longstanding nonprofit organization there dedicated to regional planning and thinking about the entire region. Um, even though I mentioned the balkanization of our regions earlier, um, Chicago also has a long history of kind of regional thinking in a way that, um, at least if not formally done, at least isn't formally been talked about. You know, the Daniel Burnham 1909 plan of Chicago is a huge regional overthinking thing which has these maps that extend up to like, you can see Door County in the background and Wisconsin hundreds of miles away. So there's like been some regional imagination in the area for a long time and there has been a level of stakeholder interest in thinking about the problems facing the region. And Chicago, by a lot of metrics, is one of the most segregated economically and especially racially um, metropolitan areas in the country. So I think you can't be familiar with the city without just thinking of how segregation affects the daily life of people throughout the entire region. Um, so I think that was the kind of background impetus for working with MPC um, to kind of get a handle on what the ramifications of this part of the area. And, and talk about some of your results. Sure. Um, so, as you mentioned, we met, I mean, on some levels, the conceit of the entire project was look, measuring the quote unquote cost. Um, and it was, I mean, I think, as you know, as you, you mentioned, I think because of that, it does stand out um, as a way to make some of these costs kind of more concrete. So this was kind of like it was kind of our um, I mean, it was intentionally the framing we chose that we wanted to kind of figure out a way to think about this in a way that was actually relatively concrete. Um, so what we ended up doing was looking at both the um, effects of economic and racial segregation on a number of outcomes. So we examined the largest 100 metropolitan areas um, of the United States between 1990 and 2010. So that was kind of our data inputs. And we looked at the, um, for particular outcomes, we set on things like income, both household and per capita, health measured by average lifespan, and safety such as homicide rates and education. So I'll spare you the technical details, but basically we ran regressions to estimate the relationship between segregation and the outcomes in these particular areas for the entire populace, for whites, for blacks, and for Latinos. So to get the costs, if you've done any math, um, more or less it's relatively straightforward once you kind of estimate those models because you just kind of plug in a number um, for the specific numbers of say Chicago, because that was our partner organization and see what happens. So what we were we weren't exactly trying to lay out a causal pathway. This wasn't an effort to figure out, you know, if X happened differently, how would this have, you know, affected three particular homicides in the region or something like that. It was more looking at the really macro level effects of what actually was going on here. So what we ended up doing um, is, you know, finding a couple of things that I think were interesting. First of all, we saw some relationship, especially with income, um, that, you know, black per capita income in the Chicago area would increase by 12.4%. And then if you aggregate that of the number of African Americans in the region, that's, you know, three and a half billion dollars. Um, also, we found things like the educational attainment rate for black and white residents would increase um, for both black and white residents, and the homicide rate would actually decrease. And these were examples of, the Chicago level of segregation went from where it is, uh, which is exceptionally high, to basically the median of the 100 cities we were focused on. So I would really a thought experiment to really kind of understand on a, a wide region that this has effects that can be measured. Um, I think we also wanted to focus on what I would consider the null effects, because there has been some research at least indicating that has indicated at times that maybe segre racial segregation has a benefits for you know, white households and white people as well. Um, we didn't find that. So what we were trying to do is create a regional narrative that an entire region would you know, possibly benefit from looking at segregation systematically and trying to figure out ways to um, address it. And one of the best ways to do that is honestly put a number on it. And that's in particular sure. what MPC did when they did their subsequent outreach. No, I, I completely appreciate the need, like you say, to put a number on it to kind of capture people's attention and, and really uh, 
uh, demonstrate what's at stake. So, so uh, just kind of talk me through it. The the costs that we uh, that we see to segregation is, for example, um, uh, people living in in uh, uh, poorer neighborhoods need to get to work, but because they can't necessarily afford to live in the downtown, they've got to um, maybe the city has to provide more and greater uh, transportation or maybe those jobs don't get filled. And so as a result, the business downtown has to offer more. I mean, it's all these secondary and tertiary effects where mm -hmm. because basically you've artificially inflated the cost of housing. Is that is that roughly it? Yeah, I think rough, yeah, roughly it. I mean, it it plays out differently. And I think we I think we wanted to stick to the numbers on our side as much as possible. So um, we did the thought experiments, but wanted to pull back a little bit. But I think you're right that those are the kinds of pathways we're talking about. And especially with the suburbanization of jobs, for instance, you have, you know, Chicago and, you know, Kansas City and much of this country has a much more dispersed job environment and opportunity environment than it used to 50 or 60 years ago. So you might be living in a neighborhood, say, in the south side of Chicago that was next to a lot of employment in the 50s. Um, now, the factories are no longer there or operating, and the service industries might be some in the city, but a lot of them are further out in the suburban um, belt of the, the region. And so you might not be living anywhere near a job that you're accessible for. Um, I think the education ramifications are also important because if we're looking at educational attainment, that varies a lot depending on the neighborhood you're in as well. I know education is a whole other broad, massive policy area, but it has a lot of similarities with um, our discussion today. And I think that's another one of those. Um, that's It's another thing that kind of leads to these effects of, in a macro scale. I want to talk uh, next about what are the ways forward, uh, either in Chicago specifically or nationwide. How can we address this? But again, uh, to the audience, let me encourage you, if you have questions, to email us at dolequestions at ku.edu. Um, I want to talk a little bit, Ed, about, uh, I, I know you've been working on uh, a city in New Jersey that that never actually adopted zoning, and uh, how are they different today, or uh, how would they be different had they adopted zoning? How are they different from the cities around them that that did adopt zoning? Uh, they adopted zoning, but in a certain way in 1939. So first of all, they were late in adopting zoning. Uh, many of the municipalities, as I said, adopted it in the 20s and the 30s. 1939 would be considered late. Uh, but when they did it, they actually followed the rule that was the standard back in the 19-teens uh, and the early 20s, which was that having a two-unit uh, structure in a one unit or next to a one unit was normal. And therefore their zoning established a zone that said you can build by right a one or two unit interchangeably, and you can tear down a one unit and build a two unit. And so I happened to grow up in this uh, town. That's how I happened to stumble on it. And uh, I was uh, look, driving through there. My sister and brother still live uh, not too far. And I happened to be uh, looking at something and I happened to Google it and I get to the Wikipedia uh, listing and all of a sudden I see it's got 22,000 people. And I go, wait a minute, when I lived there, it had 11,000 people. How in the world did it get to 22? It looks kind of the same. Uh, it was built up it, when I left there to go to college. It wasn't like there was vacant land particularly and it doesn't have any high rises to speak of. So how did this happen? And so I started digging and I stumbled on this issue of the zoning. And uh, it's very desirable area because it's about a mile and a half from the George Washington Bridge. It's at the roughly the terminus of the New Jersey Turnpike. So it's, it's easy to get throughout the New York area uh, from this location, Palisades Park. And uh, so there were always uh, duplexes and which could include, or two, two family, which could include duplexes or could include uh, accessory dwelling units or a traditional two-family house uh, that, you know, one on one floor, one on another, uh, different stairways, rentals, whatever. That was always allowed. And there was a, so always a certain percentage, but over time it grew. And it grew because uh, one of the basic concepts of, of real estate and real estate value is highest and best use. And one of the things that happened as a result of this misguided zoning that was put in place in the early 20s, starting in 1921, is it froze the use. And not only froze the use, it basically said, 
and they couldn't foresee this. This is the unintended consequence. Since the use is frozen at a single family, one unit, uh, at some point, if the land goes up in value, the only thing you can still build on here is a one unit. That's why you get the McMansions around the country, is if you can only build a one unit on an expensive lot, you have to tear down what's there and build a much more expensive house so that the land value is no longer 80 or 90 percent of the value of the package of the house in the in the land. And so uh, that's that if you allow for higher and better uses, that's the safety valve that allows the market to say, wait a minute, this land is now more useful as something else. Well, Palisades Park ended up having a microcosm of this higher and better use, but the only higher and better use allowed was a two family, uh, particularly specifically duplexes. So over a time period by today, uh, 40 or 50% of the housing units or actually by of the structures and even more of the housing units are two units. And this happened organically through the market and uh, because it was allowed. And the places around it, particularly the Leonia to the north, uh, do, do not allow that. And they have more of the McMansions, and they actually have of the people moving into Leonia have higher incomes than the people moving into Palisades Park. Now, again, if you're talking about new construction, the 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 prices are still going to be higher than existing housing. But the point is that you get more income diversity when you allow more structure diversity. And so the way I think about it is if we hadn't had the efforts that started in 1921, and we had just allowed the number of two, three, and four unit diversity to develop that had existed percentage-wise back in uh, the 20s and 30s, we'd have 8 million more dwelling units in the same footprint of what we have developed today. So we take advantage of all that infrastructure. You'd have all that added tax revenue. You'd have 8 million more units. Well, 8 million more units are a lot of units, and that would basically address our housing supply shortfall in this country. And while house, I mean, if it happened over decades, house prices would have gone up much more slowly than they have. They've gone up so quickly because in large measure, we don't have the ability to add supply and the supply we can add has been made very expensive for all the reasons we've already talked about relative to lo zoning and land use. Um so again, let me encourage uh, anyone watching with a question to email us at dolequestions at ku.edu. Uh, Mark, I know a number of cities, I think Berkeley, California, most recently has relaxed their restrictions on zoning to allow for uh, multi-unit structures. I don't know what Berkeley did exactly, but I think they got rid of their single family ordinances. Is it like, uh, like Ed said, is that um, one of the things that cities can do to overcome this? I, I don't know. Or maybe you can tell me, how does that deal specifically with segregation? I mean, we, we don't have racial segregation legally now, but maybe just uh, allowing for infill and density uh, takes care of a lot of this? It helps. I mean, I feel that there's a reason I think a lot of these kind of innovations have come out of the Bay Area. I mean, and I it, it's complicated because on some levels, the Bay Area is also you mentioned poster child earlier, but in terms of not developing, San Francisco was seen as the example of this by not having any housing constructed for years and no permits and that kind of thing. Uh, but the effort, the kind of YIMBY movement, which for people familiar with the Not In My Backyard movement, the YIMBY movement is Yes In My Backyard, which is actually kind of building a concerted effort to build support for increased density um, to address these issues. And I think that is one of those things that you see that in Berkeley, you see that with ADUs, which are accessible dwelling units, think of granny flats. Um, you'll see those examples throughout the country. Um, you'll see small levels of quote unquote upzoning. Um, you know, I mentioned, I think there's been some efforts to try rezoning re things. Washington DC is starting to put out a plan to build some of the, um, encourage some heavier development in some of the, the, the further Northwest part of the, the, the city, um, which is mostly single family housing. Um, that said, a lot of these efforts run into a lot of massive opposition and pushback um, from residents and sometimes policymakers as well. So I think it's a long-term, it has to be a very concerted and long-term effort to figure out how to get these policies to work, to think that everyone's kind of on the same page and is on the same side and actually encouraging, you know, this increased density in a way that's also not disruptive as much as possible to just lower housing costs on the long, 
sale. I mean, housing markets are weird because they're not exactly a widget. Um, people buy homes for a whole bunch of reasons. That's not just exactly the exchange value. And that means it's always going to be messy on the ground. And I think addressing what's happened over the last hundred years um, or so of concerted policy efforts to go one way will also take a fair amount of time and a lot of real work to actually go back in somewhat the other direction and lead to more equitable um, outcomes and opportunities. I imagine the resistance you talk about uh, are homeowners who live in established communities who are worried about, uh, much like they were in the 1920s, worried about the value of their home. And if, uh, if density increases across the street or on the block, they fear that uh, their value will go down, which of course is uh, the point, right, uh, of reducing ho housing costs so that we can build more of it and house more people. Um, okay. Mark, let me ask you, if... if Notwithstanding the uh, the opposition, if you had a magic wand and could just fiat, say, three reforms that you think would address uh, these issues, what might they be? I mean, I think encouraging, I mean, I think encouraging upzoning, I think, is one of those things that will be important. Um, I do think that there's something to be said for including some sort of protections to um, limit displacement if you have a particular neighborhood and only one particular neighborhood that's being, you know, hit with a, a, a very large rezoning. It might have a regional effect of decreasing, um, of decreasing housing costs, um, but it might have very real effects for people living in the neighborhood that wouldn't be that much different than what happened under urban renewal. Um, so I think there has to be a little bit of a balancing act for that, figuring out ways to creatively think about, again, I think accessory dwelling units, um, figuring out ways to have permits streamlined a little bit. Um, and I think some safety things are important and, you know, they make sense to include, but they can actually very much increase the, um, the cost of housing. I mean, same things with parking minimums in the middle of cities can add massive amounts of cost per unit. So streamlining some of those efforts um, sorry, the helicopters assigned in Washington, D.C. So uh, is, I think, streamlining some of the permitting process will also bring the per unit costs down as well. Um, and I think that's another one of those things that could be really helpful. Uh, uh, Ed, the same question for you. If you had a magic wand and could just fiat three policy changes that would address this, uh, what might they be? I think the, the first one would be what we call light touch density, which is really... Uh, these two threes and fours, which include accessory dwelling units, uh, but it has to be done correctly. Uh, and as an example, uh, California started promoting legislature started loosening the requirements for accessory dwelling units. I want to say 25 years ago. Uh, it finally took hold in LA about four or five years ago. Why? Because the localities fought tooth and nail. And so the legislature would set a broad policy, then the locality would put in constraints. And then eventually the legislature said, no, 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 you can't do that, like parking or whatever, and, uh, 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 and having uh, fees and other things. And then the localities would get creative and come up with a bunch more. And it literally took 25 years before the legislature got it right. And Minneapolis and um, Oregon are going through this today because they both passed uh, 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 ordinances in the case of Minneapolis, the statute in the case of Oregon, to promote, again, uh, duplex and in some cases three and four unit dwellings. But again, the localities are fighting it tooth and nail, and you have to make sure that uh, they don't start putting in onerous parking requirements. You can't allow them to do that. Uh, you can't, uh, you have to allow that each unit uh, can have at least a, a certain amount of square footage. Otherwise, they, they basically pass things that say, oh, yeah, uh, you can um, build two units, but you need twice as much land, which then defeats the whole purpose of the density. Uh, you have to allow height limit uh, a, 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 a high enough height that allows you to go up three stories so you can put a garage underneath on the first story. Um, and you have to have by right permitting to speed up the, the process. There are many other things, but those are the key ones that we've learned from what's gone on in, in LA. And now, light touch density has become a major uh, con contributor in LA, but unfortunately LA builds so little housing, uh, having light touch density as 50% of what gets built is great, but they still don't build very much housing. Uh, but that housing is half the price um, uh, uh, in terms of a one unit apartment. 
than it would be for the, the regular apartments that are out there. So that would be uh, number one. Uh, number two is, uh, I, I think this idea that you mentioned that it, it's going to hurt property values, I, I think we're beyond, largely beyond the segregation issue because integration in the United States has been improving year over year. If you use dissim dissimilarity indices to measure it, have been improving and I think continue to improve. We have you know ways to go, but in the single family homeowner in the home ownership area, it's improved you know a fair amount, and I think will continue to improve. Um, what we really need is greater socio socioeconomic integration, uh, which then puts people closer to jobs. And so things that allow for that uh, would also uh, be useful. And again, light touch density, I think will, will help uh, uh, support that. Uh, the last thing is we have to be very careful about what you wish for. Uh, again, the unintended consequences, even if you put the best light on urban removal and urban renewal, excuse me, and high rise uh, 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 buildings for uh, public housing, they still were massive failures. And therefore, I think we want to have more market oriented solutions like light touch density, which in the case of Palisades Park literally had, I think, hundreds of builders working with thousands of buyers to basically implement something that the government didn't actually have to uh, sort of fashion, it just had to get out of the way. And interestingly, one of the reasons it worked was because the yes in my backyard kind of was an early version of that. The homeowner hypothesis, which says that homeowners will fight to keep the property values up um, and they'll fight these other uh, things that, that may, may make sense. Well, in Palisades Park, the homeowner had a property interest in the right to build a two unit. And that was a valuable property interest. And the efforts to do away with it were actually met with a fair amount of pushback um, in the 80s, 1980s. And so, again, how you fashion these things is very important. But I, I generally come down on the side of let's come up with something that allows thousands of people to make decisions about how they're going to use property. People generally build on property that makes sense. They do something that makes sense. They're not out to create a slum and um, they're actually out to improve the property. And we don't need the government to tell them every single step of the way of what they're to do, because as we've seen, much of the time, the government has had a nefarious goal in mind that was race-based. So let me uh, go to some of the questions we got from the audience, and I will combine two of them and uh, uh, throw it out, and either one of you can take it. Uh, to what degree did white flight play a role in segregation? And uh, to what degree is gentrification, I guess whites moving back in, um, a, a solution or, or maybe exacerbating the problem? And again, either one of you that has a thought on that. Uh, I've looked a little bit at the white flight uh, from the perspective of the role FHA played. So this was another one of these unintended consequences. The 1968 Housing Act uh, greatly expanded the FHA uh, single family program, multifamily also, but single family program to allow very risky loans to be made uh, with very low 40 year loan terms, virtually zero down at very low interest rates, basically uh, near zero uh, for a 40 year loan. And what happened was speculators figured out that all of a sudden the homes that were selling, and I'm going to make up numbers because I don't actually know what the homes were selling for back in 1970. Homes, and this worked, in, this is the case in Chicago also, homes that might sell for $3,000 or $5,000, they could now sell through the financing from FHA for ten dollars or $12,000. And FHA was so scandal ridden that uh, those appraisals came in at uh, $12,000 or $15,000, and the housing was in extraordinarily poor condition. Uh, there were books written about this. One is uh, Cities Destroyed for Cash. Uh, the story of scandals at FHA written in 1972 by a Detroit news, uh, newspaper man. And this also happened in Chicago. And this is what helped the white flight. The, the whites were able to sell these houses many times through speculators. So the whites themselves didn't gain. It was the speculators being the intermediary. But these houses went from a value of X to a value of three times X. Again, it comes back to a bad idea from the 1968 Housing Act, the Section 235 program.
Mark, do you have any thoughts on either white flight or gentrification and, and how it's uh, addressing segregation or even just housing costs? Um, I'll, think, I'll focus a bit more on the gentrification side of it because I know our partners at NPC like focused on that. I mean, one of the things they identified is there's different kinds of neighborhoods in a city like Chicago. Um, and gentrification is seen as, I think, at the community level as one of the biggest challenges facing communities. Um, even though on the ground, it's probably less common than people think it is. Um, and really owns a massive issue in a, in a few cities. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind, but it is a real thing when it happens and there's real like neighborhoods probably everywhere that you can see signs of it. So I think much like a lot of the discussion and even going back to the idea of the William B movement, I think a lot of the importance is framing how this happens um, and figuring out ways that, you know, are help out um, both the existing residents as well as the, um, possibly newcomers. I mean, I think if you're going to look at, you know, racial and economic integration, I think you need to figure out a way, if you're having new development coming to, uh, you know, a poor community of color, you want to figure out a way to make everyone kind of welcome. And that's been a massive challenge, and Chicago is a very good example of that, um, that that's really difficult to make work. Um, so I think it's one of those things that just ongoing dialogue at the local level is one of those things that is really important um, to ensuring that, people are kind of all boats are lifted and it's not kind of a repeat of what's happened 40 or 50 years ago. Well, we've reached the end of our hour. Uh, let me thank uh, both my guests, Ed Pinto of the American Enterprise Institute uh, and Mark Treskin of the Urban Institute for joining us and for sharing uh, with us your insights. Please join us uh, next week, March 17, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we will be discussing uh, economic development subsidies, again, which play a role in urban development. And my guests will be Haywood Sanders of the University of Texas in San Antonio and Michael Lefebvre of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy in Michigan. Uh, thanks again. Enjoy your week. And I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday.